even the way they are. Okay. Hmm. Testing one, two, three, good. I don't want any amplification. Amplification? I thought you just needed my, my signal for that. Just turn that up. And turn, turn that down. Ah. No, oh, program volume. Yeah. Where's the center of the camera? Yeah, yeah. Uh, there we go. Got it. Mr. DeMille, I'm ready for my. How does that go? <laughs> One of the problems of distance learning is people walking outside the camera. <laughs> All right, looks like it's 4 o'clock. Let's get started. Let me repeat that if you were in Louisville and heard me talk about Codec, there's, this, is a, this is somewhat of a repeat of that. And so if you felt like you got a lot of information out of that, then you're going to get a lot of that same information here. Not that I'm trying to chase you away to go to other sessions. I enjoy having audiences. But just trying to make sure you, you knew that. All right? Good afternoon. Thank you. I'm, on, I'm making sure you're awake because I realize this is the last session of the day. And even though it's a beautiful day out, it's, 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 uh, it's a bit of a tiring day, right? And we still have many hours of uh, fun to be had um, on our three-hour tour. Um, <clears throat> CODEX stands for, sorry, my name is John Mayer, and I'm the executive director of Cali. CODEX stands for Consortium for Distance Education from, by, of, for Cali. Um, we can't figure out what that last preposition should be. And it's sort of just a handy meme to use when we're going to be talking, when, when I talk to other people about distance learning in legal education. Um, and so that's why we had to come up with some fancy uh, or clever name. I hope you think it's clever. Anyhow, what I want to talk about today is what CODEX is, uh, what it can do, perhaps, what we hope to accomplish, um, what we're not going to try to accomplish, what we're not going to touch, and um, uh, a section that I've added since Louisville that I would call beyond the obvious. And, and what I hope to do is engage you all in a little bit more discussion about some of the possibilities there. Right? <clears throat> First of all, how many people we're in Louisville. Let me let me get that sort of question. All right, very good. How many people have are from schools that in the last two semesters offered a course that you think is called distance learning or is a distance learning course? All right. And how many people actually taught that course in the room? The faculty member who taught the course. All right, very good. Thank you very much. Good. So let's start with what is Codec. Well. It's a new initiative from Cali. It's a consortium model, so you have to be a Cali member already to join. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's not just a Cali thing, meaning we're not planning on doing all of the work. Um, if we could, we would, but we can't. We don't have the time and staff and resources to, to pull something off of this size or this importance. So it's a, it's a collection of Cali and some consultants and some partnerships. Um, to be able to code the services that we plan for the website. Um, the strategic planning, and we're going to get some help from Peter Martin and Tom Bruce at the, at the LII, as well as some um, other things that I'll tell you about. And an awful, lot, an awful big dose of community input. 
Um, I rather suspect a lot of people's interest in distance learning in legal education is, yeah, I don't want to be left behind, so I'm part of that. Um, rather than, I know exactly what I want to do and you're going to produce services that are going to make it possible for me. There's, a, there's a still a tire-kicking mentality about some aspects of distance learning. And part of that is because we had the hype of the dot-com bubble saying distance learning is going to change the way everything is done, blah, blah, blah. And the hype was deafening. It was, it was insane. There were gigantic million, multi-million dollar companies. Name a few, right. Um, Unext. Are they still in business? I don't think so. Fathom. Are they still around? I, don't, I think their website's still up. Um, I know University of Phoenix's work is still. What about Western Governors, uh, that project? I, I mean, those are the three, three or four that I can think of off the top of my head that were announced with great fanfare, we're going to change the world and not necessarily delivered on those promises. Well, <clears throat> I don't want Kodak to be another one of those. And so a good portion, I hope, of my talk today will be sort of a deliberative and contemplative and reasoned approach to how we might actually get some value out of these ideas of distance legal education, rather than say, well, distance education equals good, therefore do it, therefore what? What's the slosh dot joke? Profit or something like that, right? <clears throat> it's not going to be that simple, right? So probably one of the first questions that people are going to be asking is, well, why do you need money to do this? Because Kodak is an additional fee on top of Cali's, uh, Cali's membership fee right now. And maybe what I really should say is, uh, why do you need more money? Because you're already giving Cali money in a, in, a, uh, in a membership. 187 law schools are already doing that. And the answer is because we, we weren't planning on doing this. And we believe that the scope of what we want to do, that I will describe in greater detail soon, is beyond our capabilities at this time. And so it's sort, of an, it's sort of an honest saying, well, we can't do it the way we are with our staff. And so we need to go find additional resources. We need to acquire them. And, and it's going to cost us and therefore you some money. Otherwise, we won't do it or we, or we won't do it well. It would be unwise and uh, dishonest of us to promise something that can't be delivered without honestly saying it's, going to, it's got some, some costs associated with it. Now, the hope is, though, that the costs associated with, and this is classic consortium model, right, is we can spread them out to a large group of institutions for the benefit of all of those institutions. We also think that not every law school or every institution is ready to participate in this. They're not even yet at the tire-kicking stage or don't see relevance for it in their particular situation. And so it may not be that everybody that is a Cali member or that is interested in technology is also interested in some sort of distance legal education initiative. All right? All right. So what do we think CODA can do? Well, it's, it, it really comes down to sort of a, what I hope is one sentence that I can, that can sort of spawn off an awful lot of ideas and projects and services. And that is we, re we want to reduce the barriers to taking advantage of this distance legal education opportunity that the American Bar Association is providing us. I hope I'm not telling you anything you don't know, but that the ABA has uh, promulgated some new standards for distance education that allow law schools to teach a portion of an existing course as a distance learning course, but they don't call that a distance learning course then if you keep it under one third and it's not a first year course. For that matter, no distance learning first year courses, I believe. And Peter, feel free to say, uh, uh, John, uh, yeah, let me correct you there. Um, and I can say that because Peter helped promulgate those standards. Um, and that a certain number of courses can, that, a, that a student can take at one per semester can be taken wholly as distance learning or distance legal education courses. Well, that is different from the temporary distant guidelines that said, we're looking at this. And that's different from before then when it wasn't officially sanctioned or and therefore might have been construed as being not allowed. And so there is an opportunity here. And we should examine whether there is tremendous or reasonable benefit to be had 
And that's the point of Kodak, is to see if we can leverage small bits of effort from everybody. This is many hands make light work. But it's also sort of a systems or an engineering viewpoint. If you all had to arrange with all of each other to do the many things that need to be coordinated for a successful distance learning course between two or more schools, well, that's a matrix, right? 200 schools, approximately 200 schools. That's 40,000 inter-cooperations to be coordinated. Good luck. That's going to take forever, or that's going to be very difficult. So the engineer in me says, why shouldn't there be a center point, a centralization, which getting the input from the rest of the, in, from the uh, participating institutions says, well, this is what we do know works, and we can come to a rough consensus. I'm not going to say that this is going to be a democratic vote on sort of thing. It's going to be more of a rough consensus running code sort of thing, because I think we're all sort of feeling our way through what's, what works and doesn't work here. And let's arrange it so that all the participants deal with a center on issues that they can, and that center then can also provide information back to the participants and so reduce the complexity of, of having to coordinate many things with many uh, institutions. Um, what's probably popped into your head while I said that was, duh, right? That sounds easy, right? I break down the reducing of barriers to administrative, marketing, technical, and uh, pedagogical. Goal. <clears throat> I should have said pedagogical there, but you know what I'm talking about here. And real quickly, let me run through those. For administrative, we have the problem of registering students. All right? How many of you allow students to register online through a website, let's say not within the school? Almost everybody? Oh, well, that's not as many as I thought. So for some schools, that's going to be an issue that if there are students that, if you're teaching courses from students from another state or country or time zone or planet, then that you need to be able to let them to register for the course through a website. Well, you could all, 187 or so, build your own registration systems and websites, and you can imagine the problems that would, you know, would, would then ensue with every student wanting to take a different course at a different website would have to provide different collections of information. Let's standardize on that. And so that's something that perhaps Codec could do is be a central registration uh, uh, service for that for, for, for some information. Probably not for all, but for some information. Same for grade collection, although I'm not 100% convinced that this is, because this is a very sort of scary little area, and, and the management collection and protection of grades, and it's almost like the chain of evidence in a criminal case, right? Have to make sure that that's all very nice and smooth and clear. But it, it seems like an obvious, to the engineer in me, an obvious another point of, uh, single point of collection that would be valuable. Um, and so rather than list of many, many more, I'll basically say all sorts of things that we can come to agree, agreement upon would, uh, would, be, would benefit from a centralized data movement collection storage and redistribution operation like Kodak. All right? <coughs> Any questions so far? I'm happy to entertain questions as we go along. Okay. Marketing. I actually didn't think much of this until Louisville when it was, I came to realize that one of the biggest problems of schools offering or obtaining distance learning is going to be finding each other and expanding the capabilities of, of what they've got. And so it's, it's marketing. Who's got what and do I want it? Or I've got this, who can I get to buy it from me? And that's a natural centralized thing, at least at the, at the minimal level of a, of, a, of a unified catalog, where you could require participants to provide at least enough information so that other participants can make informed decisions. All right? And so it simplifies the process if every time I want to tell people about a distance learning course that I might be offering to groups of schools or to other schools, I've got to at least give them this information. And I believe from reading Peter's material that he's going to be talking about on Saturday and even before that, that you, you need to provide chunks of the course for the student to see prior to them signing up. 
They're not just going to see a course name in a catalog and go, well, I guess I want to take that course. Because distance learning is a different animal, and it must be examined before it can be consumed. Maybe my mixed metaphors aren't so, no, not so good there. Unlike the courses that they would take in, in a regular law school, where they where there's all sorts of assumptions about, well, it's in a classroom, there's a teacher in front of me, and those sorts of things. And so since they're different, you have to show more. You have to open the kimono a little wider. Oh, forget, the, forget the metaphors. <clears throat> in regards to how you decide to market those things. The third one under marketing there was finding institutional partners. It will be a precept of Kodak that you don't, you're not required to offer courses to anybody. You're not required to let your students take courses from anybody. It has to be that way. We have to let you have the freedom, you as an institution, to say, well, I've got some courses, but I only want these schools if they have students to take them, or I only want my students to take courses from these schools. Now, the obvious sort of uh, thinking about that is, well, then only the top schools will offer courses that the bottom schools will take. But I think that there's enough flexibility in this model for all sorts of innovative or different institutional partnerships to take place. I'm thinking regional partnerships. I'm thinking independent schools. I'm thinking two schools that have specialties in two different areas that want to trade that, but neither have enough faculty to call it a certificate program. So part of an IP program here and part of an environmental law program here becomes two complete programs amongst two schools. That might be simplifying it too much, but you, I think you get, it, it communicates the idea of institutional partnerships. And Kodak is not supposed to say, well, it's a big damn free-for-all, but rather within our structure, if you can find those institutional partners through relationships that aren't explicit in, in Kodak necessarily, because remember, there's all sorts of relationships in and amongst schools and faculty. Well, those can then manifest themselves as partnerships or specific courses being offered in which Kodak is just an assist in the administrative process for that. All right? Technical. Well, technicals to me, to the engineer in me, is, is obvious. Standards, meaning, look, if we're going to push a grade record around, it should always have sort of an XML, a DTD of a certain type. A registration record requires a certain amount of information. A course posted, the data record requires a certain amount of information. This is, to me, obvious that it's a good idea. Not so obvious what that information is, and I know, have no doubt that it will evolve over time. But uh, again, it's a rough consensus, not let's spend three years deciding what that record's going to look like, and then we'll build the system. No, let's build the system with the best knowledge that we have today and know that we're going to be going through a shakeout period of, of several years. All right? Fortunately, at least I believe it's quite fortunate, we're not going to start from utter scratch. There are people in this room who have taught distance learning courses, and Peter has taught distance learning courses for six years, five, more. And we, we want to be informed by all that experience. We want to steal his good ideas and make them available to the, for the greater good of the community. All right. Well, maybe not steal them. We'll give you some money. <laughs> Finally, pedagogy. And this is, this is where I think the most rich mine is to be vain, is to be mined. Um, it's not clear that distance learning is better than live lecturing, but I don't also believe, I do not believe that it's clear that it's worse. And as long as I keep it as simple-minded as saying distance learning, I've said nothing. Because distance learning is a catch-all phrase for so many different things. All right? I'm reading a book here, which is uh, quite a good book, by the way. It's by uh, Clark Aldrich. And it's not a matter of, I'm not advertising this book, just indicating that Clark is not in the room right now. I don't know where Clark is. I don't know who, where, what state he's in. But as I read a paragraph or two, I learn something. So is that distance learning? Sort of, right? So there's an element of we've been doing distance learning all along. And only parts of what our current educational model 
is that requires actual uh, 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 synchronous presence, so to speak, in the same room and the same geospatial coordinates. Um, now, the, ver the varieties of experience in distance learning, and that's a book read at a distance or a book read by somebody written someplace else is one, or a lecture or a webcast, hello everybody out there, a webcast watched synchronously or asynchronously, or an MP3 downloaded and listened on the train to and from work for those uh, evening students that have the hour commute, or, and I could go on a long list of possibilities here, Cali lessons, tutorials, quizzes, things like that. All of these things are elements that we don't yet know how to best assemble into excellent distance education. One of the reasons why we don't know how to do it is because we're not sure what's excellent about our existing educational models. It's not that they are unexamined, it's that they are examined a long time ago and we sort of inherited what we believe to be, what we hope our ancestors were, did a good job with. There's also, of course, institutional inertia and Luddites and things like that. I won't go into that right now. But the point is, we are doing something new, and we, we need to figure out what, what, what the, what the, in, in intricate detail what the good things are that we might want to do with this. And that means, I believe, uh, a spirit of uh, experimentation or trying things to see how well they work, informed experimentation, not just wild things. Um, and then, most importantly, reporting back. This worked. This is why I, wor I think it worked. This worked well. This did not work well. We are really bad about reporting why things don't work or are bad news. Um, I'm trying to remember. Um, uh, I don't know. I've never, uh, for, for a long time, I, w I attended things like uh, Educause or even Cali conferences. And I never heard or rarely hear somebody stand up and say, well, we tried this new technology initiative and it was a complete failure. Because people tended to want to hide their failures or at least, you know, lowball them or something like that. Hmm, maybe we should do a little thing where we go around the room and have everybody admit to one failed IT experiment. But since I would have to start, never mind. Because everything I've ever done has been a complete success. You want to hear some more poetry? No. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, how are we going to get that information back? Well, we have a website, and we're going to post articles. And some of them are going to be high-level sort of, you know, I noticed a trend going on here. And some of them are going to be low-level. We did this video conferencing with this codec or with this equipment, and boy, was it a pain to, you know, arrange or something like that. All right? And so that's the pedagogy issues is we, we, we want to be able to collect best practices and share them back to the community. Explicitly, we want to do that. All right. So what codec won't do? Let me pause for a moment and say, any questions at this point? And a good instructor says, there must be questions. All right, let me ask a, oh, you got lucky. Any comments? Now, what's funny is the one thing you didn't mention about, you mentioned, you know, does the other school have equipment? You know, does it match up with mine? You didn't say anything about, do they have a staff with a clue? And that's, frankly, the most important thing because equipment can be purchased and uh, protocols can be matched. But 
staffs with clues are limited in our world. Right? IT departments are thin in law school and legal education. Um, and video conferencing may not be considered IT. It's AV or it's classroom or it belongs to the, uh, the, the, the larger uh, university or something like that. And what I hope, and this is, maybe this is going to sound like sacrilege, um, what I hope is that Kodak will prevent people from, from everybody from having to hire full-blown video conferencing staffs. But we can't get away from the fact that we got to have a clued in IT for whatever it is the nature of what's being supported for distance learning you know, to make it go right, it, certainly in the early runs until it becomes pervasive and obvious and as easy as plug and play more than three years out from now. Comment, question? Sure. This is exactly where Kodak is at this moment. Not finding the answers, but gathering the questions. There's a, there was a, I, heard, I heard five or six, actually. Yes. Um, in, in, you know, and, I, and I have an urge, um, because I used to be a help desk person and like to just give answers and get people off my back fast, to give you a bunch of fast answers. But I'm going to shut up and say I don't know the answers to all of those questions, other than I know that there are some things that are less staff intensive that are less technology intensive. Um, I know that there are some things that don't require uh, the large uh, revenue stream. You know, there's ways to put your uh, big toe in the water and not sort of jump whole hog into the water for an institution or for an instructor or for a single course. Um, There you go. Is John Christensen? John? No, oh, right in front of me. Jeez, sorry. So we're going to be doing a survey soon of video conferencing equipment staffing and capabilities of all uh, schools. And it's not a Kodak thing, but we're going to help you. We're going to work, we're going to work with Kodak. It's an ABA, what's our committee name? Right. <laughs> right, and so you'll be hearing much more about that within in a, well, after this conference, I take off a week, and then a week after that. <laughs> um, and that's going to be one of the first big surveys that will be part of Kodak is what video conferencing um, capabilities do you have? You can help us. We're going to, it's, of course, we're going to automate the survey, but what, what I expect to happen is we'll get 25 or 40 percent of you to actually fill out the web form, and then we're going to have to hit the phones to, to get the, you know, the rest of you to fill them out. And the problem there is you finding the person who can answer the questions. You know? And so that, that will be one of those things. Tom, did you have a comment? almost, I think it might be my next slide. Oh, yeah, it's actually the third point of my next slide, which is we don't want to reinvent the wheel. And what I mean by that is if there are technical mechanisms that already exist or code or software, I'm not, we're not going to rewrite Blackboard or WebCT or Twin. All right? We're not going to invent something out of a whole cloth because that's what we have to do. This is not, codec is not short for coding. All right? And same for social or institutional mechanisms that already exist. Let's play on those that already exist rather than attempting to explain to people new ones that would require all sorts of curriculum committee meetings that we all know would be uh, problematic to making institution-wide decisions, right? So the first one also uh, is relevant, requiring uh, we are not going to require particular approaches or technologies. And I should... I should uh, 
um, explain that a little bit. What I mean by that is not particular approaches or technologies for how you might want to, how you might want to offer a course. If you want to offer a course in Swahili over Morse code, be my guest. Now, that doesn't mean anybody's going to take it, but Codex's not going to have a rule against the way certain courses are delivered or something like that. Um, so there's a, but, so there, but there is an element of a marketplace involved here. And it's obvious that you're going to want to offer courses or you're going to want to, if, you're, if it is a selling situation, you're going to want to offer things where people will be most conducive to buying them, I would assume. All right? We will be requiring adherence to certain standards, but that's going to be, like I said, the community consensus standards of, you know, if, if you want to participate, then you have to tell your students to register here, and they have to provide this amount of information. And we're going to spit it back to you. And we can't write 200 conversion programs for Codec to fill in the blank of your local administrative registration system. But we'll give it to you in some reasonably generic data format that a reasonably smart person or techie can convert into DataTel or Colleague or Banner or whatever your local administrative system is, comma delimited, XML, CSV formats or something like that. All right? So that, that's stepping into it a little bit. We, for this to work, you have to conform at least a little bit, but the goal of the organization will be to not make it too hard for you if we possibly can. All right? Any questions about that? All right. We're not going to require alliances or partnerships other than with sort of the central coordinating body of Codec. And that means if you want to offer a course and you only want to let Harvard students take it, then that's perfectly fine. For that matter, if you want to offer a course and only let students at your own school take it and you want them to register through Codec, well, that would be fine too. It would be a little unusual, I guess. So it, it's it's... But, but uh, what, I, what I hope that will bubble up out of this, and I'll get to you in a second, Philippa, is that people will start to realize, hey, there, there, there's opportunities for institutional cooperations or partnerships here, and the model won't prevent them from trying them out or from aggressively pursuing them. Go ahead. I didn't put a slide in there for training. How silly of me. Boop, boop. Technical. Training. There it is. I knew I had it. <clears throat> um, yes, training. And, um, and um, we're, we're, we're sort of beta testing or we're, we're doing that first bit of training on Saturday with a couple of sessions uh, from Peter and from Deb Quintel on uh, some new features from Cali Author and Peter demonstrating how you might record your own web lectures, a method uh, or a process that he's found successful and has done and used successfully in his courses. Um, I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm being careful about how much training we can provide because, because, that, because training implies sort of a packaging Towards, towards a particular end, and we don't know sort of where the end are, so we're doing a little bit of the, of the baby stepping. But... Mm -hmm. Makes total sense. Absolutely. Distance learning courses to teach about distance learning courses. It's kind of a little self-referential, but it makes total sense. Um, <clears throat> it's, it runs into the problem of that distance learning being a catch-all. What do you mean? Are you going to do video conferencing to hundreds of schools? Well, we don't have the knowledge or the ability to, to connect all those things up. Are you going to do web lectures? Are you going to do, here's an article to read? You know what I'm saying? But, but that, that's absolutely the direction that, we're, that we would be heading. Question. Wait. 
Yes. I thought that's where you were going. Yeah. Certification is too strong a word in, in, in what I believe to be still an experimental area. But, but you, you're, you're, your sentiment is right. We, in order to do these things, which are somewhat human resource intensive, um, uh, that's where money comes into play, hiring people to do that work above and beyond the staff that I've got working for me at Cali. Absolutely. Other questions or comments? All right. So let's go beyond the obvious, but um, like all good law professors, be first, before the obvious, or first the obvious, and, and I hope this is obvious, that, um, there's, there's, that some of the possibilities out here is that a law school would offer courses to students that they don't have instructors for locally. So Codec could be something of an adjunct aggregator, although an adjunct could mean somebody who's a full professor at another school. All right? You could create certificate programs with teachers from other schools. That's sort of the same idea, just, just a little bit more of a larger uh, chunking of the packaging going on or something like that. Um, uh, increase enrollment and income? I don't know. That depends on how aggressive you are willing to play the game of saying, well, we're going to offer more, we're going to have our faculty teach courses with the explicit intent of bringing in revenue from students who are not full-time matriculants at our school. Um, or perhaps, and this was sort of a dumb one in, my, in some ways, but a real one if you have serious space issues, um, to ease space or crowding issues because one-third of a course could be done at a distance. And so that room is now available. Some of you probably are in the opposite direction, needing to justify having renovated classrooms and things like that. All right? So if those are the obvious, well, then what's beyond the obvious? Well, um, eh, well I'll get to that in a second. Um, nope, I'm going to fix that right here because I can. There we go. Ah. So beyond the obvious are things like team teaching and collaborations. In other words, maybe no money is changing hands here, but instructors who know each other in multiple institutions and want to find, want to partner up to teach the same course, and maybe there's a live component, an in-class component at each institution, but they, but they share some aspects or some key lectures that, they're, that they are feel especially good about uh, delivering to each other. All right? This is a maybe more general version of something that you described where you bring in guest lectures, judges, practicing attorneys, or something like that for one-offs or two-offs or something like that. But perhaps Codec, the, the, the point about Codec is if there's a way to model or a way to gather who is willing to do this sort of thing under what circumstances and with who? And I know that's a bunch of open question marks in that select statement. Um, but if there's a way to gather that information and be a classified ads of that type of thing, I think it has to be more than a classified ads. That's too scary. There has to be some underlying um, vetting of information. But I don't know what exactly that is. But if we can provide that information, then maybe we can facilitate that sort of team teaching or collaboration. International markets. Cha-ching! No. Um, is, there, is there a way to... <laughs> is there a way to sell or buy or to train our students in the coming global legal infrastructure? EU law, Japanese law, Asian law, and so on and so forth. I'm in the right school to say this. They have uh, an Asian Pacific uh, law center here in which they're doing just those sorts of things trying to figure out how to train students from the People's Republic of China and, and also U.S. students, law students, in Chinese law. 
And rather than, and this is a, a gross over, oversimplification, the rest of the world trying to figure out the U.S. legal education market or vice versa, perhaps some of that centering or uh, collaborative uh, centering could happen again through CODEC in which members from Europe, Asia, Australia, South America, other countries can participate. And that dovetails nicely with Cali's recent efforts to more internationalize our materials. Our interface for Cali Author can now be changed to German, Dutch, French, Portuguese, Spanish, and I'm going to forget one. Oh, yeah, Pig Latin. Um, that was our testing language. Um, and so even though, you know, and, and so people, uh, the, the Dutch have used it uh, quite. Is Peter here by any chance? Peter de Graaf? Okay. Um, they've used it quite successfully to, uh, to be, I mean, they, oh, yes, we all speak English. But this is wonderful that we can work in our own language on the interface for Cali Author. All right. Legal education to non-law students, like who? Well, anybody that's not a law student. Um, business professionals, MBAs, people that don't want to necessarily take, get, uh, obtain JDs, but want or need legal information, and can either go to Google and get that information and walk into their lawyer's office with it, with that stack, like Clay was talking about this morning, or you can smile for the camera and say, we'll participate in that market of, tr of helping people learn about the law uh, with all the usual disclaimers about not giving them any certification to be lawyers or to practice for themselves. But what's funny about this country is you can be a lawyer if you're not a, even if you don't have a JD, as long as you only represent yourself. And that's what I call a loophole you can drive trucks through. And, and there seems to be a desire of people to drive their own life's trucks through that loophole to represent themselves in ever more complicated situations. And it's not a matter of, well, they shouldn't do that. That's the first thing Clay said, stop. It's not a matter of, well, there should be this legal literacy thing where we all, well, do you remember how we all didn't know about PCs and now we're all technologically literate or we all didn't care about medicine or health because the doctors did it, but now we're all worried about nutrition and low-carb diets and now we're health literate. And the next big literacy is legal literacy because we want to advocate a cause or protect ourselves or deal with these issues without having to go to the professionals. Well, I don't know. But maybe law schools can participate in that growth industry of teaching law to non-lawyers. Do I see what? Sorry? They don't have any money. Forget them. <laughs> if I'm being brutal, but um, it would be it would be interesting if uh, if if penitentiaries wanted to uh, provide that information in their in their libraries, and there were willing pro bono teachers to do that. Sure. Why not? I I know little about this. I'm not taking it as a joke at all. The courts are clogged with lawsuits. How many times have we heard things like that, right? You know what? It's not going away by just making it harder to file a lawsuit. It's going away by people being smarter about the system. Sorry, I should have started that by saying, I'm on a soapbox and here's an editorial. You don't solve problems by making people dumber or by making systems more restrictive in this new age. You solve them by making information more accessible and let people work out how to game the system. If the system's broken, we'll fix it, but you don't fix it by restricting it tremendously further, at least not in the, in, I believe, in the area of law or justice. We are supposedly at war for that reason, I think, right? You know, to bring rule of law. You know, we have to practice it locally as well. All right, off my soapbox. Legal education to lawyers, CLE. How many law schools here offer CLE courses? Almost everybody. How many of those CLE courses, if you know the answer, are taught by law professors? Oh, my goodness. Yeah, most, some? I heard a some, all? 
No, you bring in other practitioners to teach that. That's an interesting little model, isn't it? You're a law school, and some of the teachers that you hire to teach other lawyers are not your tenured faculty. They're other lawyers. Well, is that fodder for codec? I don't know. I'm going to beg off and say I'm not sure yet. But once an infrastructure is in place for cooperation, you know, what's to prevent a group of law schools in a state taking on the PLIs or the other large for-profit, PLIs not for-profit, but other for-profit CLE sort of things, and realizing that revenue for themselves rather than for those for-profit groups. It is a market. All right. Partial distance legal education, that's the one I like the most. And I guess that's the, that's the one where you don't have to turn an entire course into a distance legal education course. You know, I'm not going to be here next Friday, get your web lecture off, or get your lecture off the web. So, so that's what I meant before when I was talking about being able to dip your little toe or your big toe into the water and experiment in small ways with distance education and see how that worked or affected. One of the features we're adding to Cali Author, and I don't have a picture to show you, um, is uh, basically you could take Cali Author, you can write some multiple choice questions, and you press a button. It's called the Auto Publish button. What that will do is it will squirt those questions up to the Cali website and give you back a, UR, a URL that's unique. You hand that to your students. Students go there, answer the questions. And then you can go back to the website and see how they did in individually and in aggregate. And so it's sort of instant quizzes. It could be like sort of like midterms, but I don't want to call it a test because the security issues of distance learning are, 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 are too uh, hinky to, to say we know whether or not the person who's pressing the button at the other end of the, of the, of the Internet is actually the person that you have to give the grade to. Right? Uh, there's no way to do that until we have thumb scanners on every PC. And even then, maybe the other person, well, one holds the thumb, the other one answers the question, right? So, I mean, that's, that's one of those intractable problems that may never be solved, except by saying open, you know, is, is the consistency of their performance throughout the, throughout, the, uh, um, throughout the course consistent with the grade that they got as a final, right? Um, we're going to take that a step further and say, faculty, if they want to take our lessons, our existing lessons, and call us up and say, well, I want to do this thing where I take an existing lesson, and I'm going to add some commentary to it. Now, we're, we're, we're struggling with the problem of making sure that the commentary doesn't sound like you're putting words into our author's mouths. But then they can take that lesson, republish it back to the website, to our website, auto-publish it, um, and then have your students take that lesson, an existing lesson that maybe has been cut down or used as a starting point for developing something more complex. All right? Those are distance learning pieces that we hope our library of 397 lessons act as uh, starting points for delivering those things. And if you listen to Steve Bradford and Marie, uh, Mary LaFrance and Robert Lind this morning um, talk about all the ways that Cali lessons help faculty, you, you can understand how we think that it's not just that we have a tool for creating lessons, but we also have a library of materials written by experienced faculty, experienced teachers. And we want to turn that out as a starting point for a knowledge management experiment. In other words, you will start to contribute, you in the larger sense of small bits of valuable teaching capability or nuggets of excellent lecturing or something like that. And, and that's my fondest hope for Kodak, is that we can structure the knowledge in small enough chunks for repurposability. And then later, some models will bubble up of what works best in those in, in distance learning situations. And we can start to answer the first question I started with, which is, is distance learning better than lecture, live lectures, or is distance learning worse? And the answer is it depends on how you've built it and structured it. It's in the details. Oh, that was last year's conference. All right. Any questions? Oh, we got a question?
The obvious one. Certainly. If you're wondering what S to S stands for, that's, in, that's, um, that's my uh, student to student learning. And I, and I hesitated whether I wanted to stick that up there because the only example I could think of was uh, the Berkman Center's rotisserie where what they would do is they would have students write, last, uh, write essay answers to simple essay questions and then send them to each other. And they had a piece of software that coordinated that everybody got, only got one, and then the students would grade each other. I'm concerned about a model that lets students grade each other as all instructors should be. But maybe there are situations or, or particular things where, they're, they're, where coordination amongst, where, where some sort of web-based or centralized service could assist in the teaching process, um, or maybe at least in the socialization into law process, which is one of the things that we're so concerned about if our students never come to our august buildings and become socialized into the Stepford lawyers that we want them to be. Oh, did I say that out loud? Sorry. <laughs> yes. Then, then that maybe that, that reassures me because my worry there is what if they give bad advice to each other? Student to student interaction. Mm -hmm. Very good. I highly urge you to go see, if you're interested in successful models of some types of distance learning, to see Paul Maharg's sessions on Saturday. Um, wait, are both your sessions on Saturday? Uh, one tomorrow. One tomorrow, one Saturday. Um, especially from Sims to Ard Kulik. I am dying to see, to hear the update on, on Ard Kulik. Um, and um, we, we've copied your paper. We've got like about 100 copies of your paper for the uh, virtual learning environments. And he's done a lot of work in uh, webcasting and where it's most appropriately inserted into um, uh, yeah, distance learning or at least an off outside the classroom experience. Um, and it's a great read. I, I got so many insights from that paper. Um, and so pick a copy of that up and, and learn from somebody who is, who's, who's, uh, who, who's done this very difficult stuff. Sure. First of all, could I say that you know, as a post web designer to Ali um, and this is the first time I've seen him. I think it's quite a remarkable project uh, because it's um, a long time overdue. It's necessary as well. Mm -hmm. Particularly as you say.
Thanks, Paul. One more question or comment, and then we'll break a little early because we have a boat to catch. Who dares to have the last comment? What next? What next? Brilliant question. No, what a great question. Of course. <laughs> we'll be sending invoices. And, and no, I'm serious. We'll, 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 they'll, we'll, we're going to piggyback them to save postage on the uh, Cali invoices. Yeah, about two weeks after the conference. Um, and we'll be announcing stuff on the codec.cali.org website for where more trainings will be happening with Peter involved. All deans and associate deans received uh, from the ALS mailing list received the memo and the letter about a week ago. It was also emailed as a PDF to all Cali reps. The next step is, and we ran out of time, all the library directors who we don't, didn't mean to keep you out of the loop, just didn't get to it before the conference. Um, and then we take it from there. Glenn Peter. Yep, library director, right? Associate Dean? You didn't get it from the Associate Dean list? You fell off a radar for a second there, so we'll, I'll make sure you get something. All right? I, well, we figured as much, but hopefully, hoped it would trickle down. Thank you very much. See you all in the Argosy. As long as it's a conference hotel, yes. Silver Cloud, University Towers, University Inn, and Waterton. At 6 p.m. And then there will be one bus here okay. at the law school. No, they're bus buses. New poetry? Hey. Do we need to have her name tags to get on the cruise tonight or just the invitation thing? Bring that. Be in touch, John. <laughs> Sorry, Glenn. Yeah, we'll right. we'll just, uh, there's, eight, there's, the there's 800 just people in that damn list, too. Well, I'm, 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 I'm like, what, how many assistant teams are there? Well, it's, it's up on the website, codec.cali.org, if you want to just go get, get it right by yourself. Yeah. Sorry about that. <laughs> All the, all the conference hotels, so definitely the water tank. Yes. See you. Not yet. Next step. We're, we're getting there. Actually, we'll, we'll, do it. we'll probably do it through the, through the mailing list. Yeah. Good. I was not there, so I Yeah, I know. Um, I'm going to skip the cruise today because I'm tired. Sure. I'm going to go uh, rewind tapes and whatnot. We're taping up a storm. Anyway, you knew I'd be. Yeah, just tapes, man. Just they just suck. Tapes. I know they're gigantic. Oh, man, they're huge. So they didn't even buy. Is it because they don't have any uh, div? Uh, what, high eights? No, no, they have like no. There's no digital. They, there's no digital things. And they, they have two DVD burners, though. Why didn't, they, the why didn't they do hi eight tapes though? Nobody uses VHS. Well, because you got to bring them in, something like that. Yeah, they probably they probably didn't want to spend you know eighty seven thousand dollars. It's not that expensive. It was about five yeah, years ago. You know, you know what they probably do? They they probably like tape stuff. And they 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 put out those tapes. Nobody's got v VCRs at home anymore. Everybody's got DVDs. <laughs> <laughs>
myself off there. I'm going to turn the projector off. Actually, you know what? That's what I should do. That's what I should do. I'm here, right? Yeah. I should patch through those VHS tapes to their DVD burners. Yeah, that's that's right. Right. Oh, I know. There's some, there's some like uh, loose, rough edges here. Did you say something to I'm sorry, do you know about Cook? Yes. Deans and associate deans. And if you're the Cali rep, we emailed them. Yeah, I didn't see anything. Oh, actually, that's one thing I forgot to mention in my presentation. It's okay. Right? We knew that this would happen. The second order effects that we're learning about having all our database stuff. Yeah. Is well, the ALS mailing lists <laughs> suck. But they're the only thing we got until we build up our own. That, that, that we will keep up to date, so unlike ALS. Codec.cali.org. It's all posted there. It's all, all posted there, okay. Yeah. Right. And, and the problem that I, was, that I didn't want to mention, because I mean, every, everyone here, I, I suggested to our academic team that we look into, or that we, that we offer, at least see if there's some messages, to do Peter's uh, uh, Social Security course this last semester. It, why would we do that? <laughs> How do you get people interested? How do you get ah, that, that, you're, that, that's like the first step, and that's the hardest one. Yeah. Um, mostly, I'm I'm going to be happy for the for at least the short term to be dealing with the people that are already interested, and and not try to wake up the dead. Um, I'm hoping that what'll happen is the collaborative. It, it'll, it'll happen through the grapevine outside of our marketing efforts, right. meaning. Hey, aren't we, why aren't you doing, you know, that sort of thing? The whisper stream or the uh, rumor mill or the uh, tipping points, we'll, we'll work on that. And then we're cooking because you could put nine hours in each one, right? Nine sessions. Is Hastings an independent law school? Hastings is. What, what about, aren't you University of California Hastings? Oh, okay. These things was designated the law department of the University of California in the original state constitution. Oh, okay. This is a long story, and I'm not interested. Not right now, at least. I'm just really so, tired. We're, we're completely independent. <laughs> we have our own. Because I realized that it was only a couple days ago. You're like, so, you want to do this independent law school thing? I'm like, right. hey, you're you're a UC school right, though. Right, right. Okay. Well, that's cool. We have our own board of directors, so we're completely out. It's cool, and it's yeah, it's, it has drawbacks. Yeah, of course, it does. So you like South Texas and Cooley and uh, so Chicago Kent thinks of itself a little a little independently because we well, don't I have wondered to. Why that, why I wondered why Chicago Kent wasn't on the list. Uh, well, they're not independent. They're part of IIT. They don't consider themselves. Yeah, but, but, but Seattle is on the list because they consider, they, they it's a self uh, so, Right, self right, right, right. right. Yeah. And I guess I mean, the some, ABA. Some are like really obvious. <laughs> some are less obvious. Too, which used to be called Detroit College of Law. They're on the list. Uh, well, they merge now, right? Yeah, yeah. they merge yeah. with MSU. But they still, I guess, this is still on the list. See you on the boat. Very good. See you in the boat. I gotta find my plaques. Do you know where they are? Uh, I saw, yeah, I saw a box back in the storage room. Said author plaques. On yeah, 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 yeah. That's it. Because only one of those tapes can run, they're not going anywhere. So gonna take with Eventually they'll get to the end and then stop. <laughs> yeah, that's what tapes are for. And we'll fix it in the mix. Whoa! Did you hear did you hear most of that? Um no. I love well, yeah, the you know. It seemed pretty good. You had the biggest crowd. That's amazing. Considering I had hocked it. Yeah. And, but I, I just wanted to sort of cover this. I meant, I meant to tell you that the um
doing now? <laughs> uh, my spy cam tells me. Well, at least he's thinking of me. <laughs> hey. All downhill. Yeah, From here. I grew it and lost the weight. But okay. really <laughs> But that would be something that would be really good to have is a place to like stow things like this. During the day? During the day. Like like right now instead of having to go back to the hotel. Yeah. There's no way to do that. <laughs> it's a bailment. It's That's a bailment thing. It's a bailment thing. <laughs> okay. No, we, we're having trouble finding a luggage room even for Saturday. That's yeah. Yeah. so it would be difficult to do that. Yeah. Yeah. You know, we're, we're, just more we're using right. almost all their space. Security. How's the first day, John? I think it was well. Actually, I'll turn that around. Not as good as the first day do. We didn't get ready. The game didn't oh, get canceled. Right. <laughs> yes, we did. We did. Tell people, those Bellas, they were last year. Yeah, we're true. always planning for the most previous conference. That's right. You're always fighting the last war. <laughs> that's right. That's right. That's, that's exactly. What we do. That's cost. <laughs> Should warn people that next year we're going to have like parasol uh, sunscreen. Next year, Kelly sunscreen. Yeah. Tom or John? <laughs> oh yeah. yeah. Oh man, I know it's hot out there. But it won't be tonight. So people are going to be. It will be cool. I'm not going. I'm going to skip that. I'm not going to cruise it. Kathy Klein. So are you coming on the cruise, or that's something you've done a billion times, or at least once? I've been working on subtext stuff today, but so is it going okay? Everything's going fantastic. Good. Well, since you won't be there, I, w I will be publicly acknowledging your 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 contribution. Thank you very much. You didn't do anything. Well, then the hell with you then. No. Oh, thank you. You've been wonderful. I was just gonna. Grab one of these for my own reference. So, mm -hmm. you know, I'm, I'm glad things were okay and the technology didn't foul up on you at all. Okay. Things seem to be working. Good. You know. Good. Okay. No, nothing. No, no, no gross surprises. You know, okay. all the usual small little glitches. Yeah. Wireless doesn't work in this little corner of the room oh, here. Okay. You know, but duh. You know. <laughs> okay. okay, and have beautiful weather. I know. Cruise, I, know. Just, just I know. I'm so looking forward to it. I will. You same same here. Oh my goodness! I still have my mic on. <laughs> I gotta go put it back. <laughs>